Hello, uh, Richard Walker with video number 15. So in the last video, Professor Tamman and Professor Varth posed the question, why did the price of the South Sea Company move up so rapidly? And they added that understanding the causes of major bubbles has been a challenge to financial economists and historians alike. But is it so difficult to understand why the price rose? The professors earlier in the chapter say that when the first shares were issued at a bargain basement price, it was the king, his son, the Prince of Wales, members of the House of Lords, MPs, merchants, and of course bankers, including that sophisticated investor Richard Hall, who got in quickly. A lot of people buying a lot of shares means that the share price will rise. Naturally, as Shakespeare said, what the great ones do, the less will prattle of. And so lesser people would naturally have been curious. And their growing interest coincided with an artificially restricted supply. But fortunately, as Professor Tamman and Voth tell us, the South Sea Company also lent generously against its own shares. Let's just think about that for a moment. When those Renaissance Italians came up with this method of getting the people working hard and cheap, they used a trick of making imaginary loans to the government. Yes, imaginary. Remember, Professor Ferguson said money is simply trust inscribed. Trust is only something created in our imagination, after all. And you know what they created were just intrinsically worthless objects. By themselves, they create absolutely nothing. The only reason those Italian oligarchs went to all this trouble was to create an obedient and cheap workforce. Only then could something useful be created. When the oligarchs agreed alone with the government, money was created out of nothing. And to get the workforce working even harder, they organised companies who would agree loans with the oligarchs. So again, money was created out of nothing. And the South Sea Company did exactly the same thing. They created money out of nothing every time somebody borrowed to buy shares. As people line up to borrow to buy a thousand pounds worth of shares, the price of those shares rises. With all of that, it is hardly surprising that the price rose rapidly. But as Archibald Hutchison, MP for Hastings, wrote at the time, there is no real foundation for the high price of South Sea stock. It seems to be the universal opinion that the present price of South Sea stock is much too high. And the Archbishop of Dublin, months before the crash, said that most investors in South Sea stock are well aware it will not succeed, but hope to sell before the price falls. One investor instructed her broker to buy as much as possible, but to sell it out again the next week. She said she had no confidence in the South Sea Company, but she was sure that she would make money, providing she got out quickly. None of these people were operating under the influence of emotional volatility or irrational exuberance. They were thinking very clearly. They knew prices were rising simply because people were buying these shares, and they knew prices would stop rising when the supply of buyers dried up. They fully understood that it was essential that they got their timing right, which is, of course, something that is always much easier for the insiders to do. And remember, the insiders are stoking this. Remember what the two professors said. The South Sea Company also lent generously against its own shares. Obviously, it's easy to buy shares, and if it's easy, people will buy. What does that do to the price? Will that attract more people to borrow more money and buy? You bet. And the insiders just have to pay attention to when their powerful friends safely cash in. Once the in crowd have made their killing at the top of the market, then the South Sea Company turn off that easy credit. Bankers like nice Mr. Hall also shut down their credit and then they start short selling to ride the market profitably throughout the rapid collapse, just as they rode it profitably on the way up. Unsurprisingly, some folks believe that it was not financial sophistication that made you a winner. Ruthlessness was what mattered. 
But what can we expect? If you believe that society is being run as a gambling den, and you also know that the game is rigged, it's not ruthlessness, it's survival. And of course, if you are one of the survivors going back to your beautiful home with your trousers stuffed with the winnings, it doesn't do to dwell on the massive poverty that the losers will suffer. Homelessness and suicide are inconvenient intrusions. Best not consider your part in the outcome. Better to blame the result on irrational exuberance or emotional volatility. And indeed, there was a lot of emotional volatility when the bubble did burst. Indeed, there would be something seriously wrong with the emotional intelligence of a person who lost everything, found themselves up to their neck in a debtor's prison, if they didn't exhibit extreme emotional volatility. The emotional volatility was certainly not the cause, but it was definitely a perfectly predictable result of a massive boom and the inevitable bust. Professors Tamman and Voth say that with each new issue of South Sea Company shares, the price rose dramatically. And perhaps most interestingly, they say that when the fourth and final issue of the shares was made, merchants and bankers were largely absent. MPs and members of the House of Lords, who had bought stock early in the game for more than a million pounds, now only took £77,000. I can't help feeling that they might have known something. This was a classic bubble, which developed as all financial bubbles do. So it is difficult to understand Professor Schiller's comment that the path of a naturally occurring Ponzi scheme, if we may call speculative bubbles that, will be more irregular and less dramatic, since there is no direct manipulation. There was intense and very direct manipulation by the insiders, as there has been in every one of the highly profitable subsequent financial bubbles, up to and including the bubble that inflated from 2001 to 2007. Through direct manipulation, the market valuation grew until the South Sea Company was approximately two times the value of all the land in Britain. The professors follow that amazing statistic with this. However, detecting bubbles is conceptually challenging. It is difficult to see what is conceptually challenging about detecting a bubble that has taken place in a company whose value rose to the impossible height of two times the value of all the land in Britain especially considering the South Sea Company's lamentable trading record prior to 1719. Well, it was not lamentable. It was non-existent. As the professors say early in the chapter, in 1718, Spain seized the assets of the only ship that ever sailed. And they add the slave trade also failed to flourish. Of course it was a bubble. And all bubbles are built on deceit. The easy credit offered by the shareholders and the fact that those shareholders, like Richard Hoare, could pump the market. When Hawes bought, the market on average rose substantially, over 10 days to 14.7%. These numbers are quite large. The 10-day performance, for example, implies an annual gain of 1,686%. The result? On November 27th, 1721, it was time for the partners at Hawes Bank to take profits. Henry Hawes, the senior partner, had £21,000 transferred to his private account. The partners earned as much in 1720 to 1721 by buying and selling stock as they had during the 20 years previous. The professors end up making a very important observation. The bank was most successful in trading the most volatile assets, suggesting that bubbles can be an important business opportunity for sophisticated investors. Hedge funds in the late 1990s showed a similar pattern. Not exactly a major intellectual triumph. How can a hedge fund make profitable bets 
if prices don't move. And of course, the more dramatic the rise and fall, the bigger the profits. For the insiders, that is. Well, thank you for watching. Click like, subscribe, leave a comment, and please watch video number 16, where we look a little more at what Professors Temen and Voth discovered. And, of course, look again at Professor Schiller's carefully worked theory of bubbles. Thank you.